I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, before we start the reorganization of the board, I just want to welcome Charlie Knicki to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. And Shannon Cutler is not with us tonight. I think she's on vacation. Um, but we will welcome her when she comes. Um, the first order of business tonight is to reorganize the board. Um, at this point, I would open nominations for a chairman of the board. I'd like to make a motion to eliminate Elizabeth Moulton for chairman. I say eliminate. No. Did I say you eliminate? did say eliminate. Why are you slip? Nominate. Can you second it? I second it. <laughs> You're out, Liz. Wow. Take that. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? All no. those in favor? Aye. aye. Oh, I can't good. vote. I can't say aye. No, so okay. Aye. I abstain. Uh, do I need a motion to close the? Yeah. <laughs> I can cl close. Seeing no objections, we'll close the nominations. Uh, I would take a motion to nominate a vice chair. I would make a motion to nominate John Martin vice chair. I'll second that. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. <laughs> we can close the. Sort of. Right. I need a motion to nominate a clerk. To the Board of Selectmen. It's because she's on vacation. I nominate Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. So there's a, there's a motion and a second to nominate Shannon Cutler as the clerk of the Board of Selectmen. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I would close nominations if there's no other discussion. Okay. So welcome to Vice Chair. Thanks. Not on this many meetings. But <laughs> That's okay. Okay. I'm thinking of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we will move on to the liaisons to um, different departments and commissions by Board of Selectmen. Um, seeing that we have two new members of the board, I hope we can move some of this around. We can start with the almoners. John, they don't meet very often, do they? I'm, no, I'm fine. Okay. Jackie, you're on CPC. Do you have any concerns with that? Nope. Um, currently, I'm on the Finance Committee with Ed, and I was hopeful that someone else could take that over. Um, you do have to go to the meetings regularly. Charlie, is there anything on here that looks exciting to you? Well, given the fact that I'm working on the public safety complex, I was figuring on police and fire, because I'm meeting with them okay. anyways all the time. Okay, so I'm going to leave this open for a second, and I'm going to put Charlie in at the fire. Police. And the police. Yep. And what do you want to do with the public safety complex? I plan on staying on as chairman of that committee. Yep. Can you do? Can you do both? Well, Maybe no. Maybe both. we should just have John as the liaison to it. He likes to hear what's going on with that. How do you feel about that, John? Staying there. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Um, and you're also on the master plan. Correct. Yep. Okay. So I guess, seeing that Shannon's not here, I would nominate her to be on the Finance Committee. Okay. Anybody have any objections to that? No. No. And the Highway, so we have the Highway Department left. I really like the School Committee, so I would like to stay there. And I also, as weird as this is, really enjoy the PPPB. Well, I'm doing fire and police, so let me pick up Highway also. Just have all three? Is, okay. They're all going to be interrelated as time right. goes on anyways. So that leaves the... ZBA? Right. So Jackie, can you take over the ZBA as the ZBA alternate? Um, my husband's on that committee. Does it matter? Oh. oh it's an alternate. It shouldn't. We have multiple committees in town with husband and wife, brother and sister, and everyone else on the committee. So it shouldn't be a problem? Yeah, that's okay. Because half the time, Nilda gives me, tells me when he has a meeting anyway, so I don't, I'm coming. You know, she emails me. So you can be the ZBA yeah, alternate? Fine. Yeah. Okay, so is there anything left? Do you want to go through it? John, you're the almoners. How many do you have? One, three. two, three. Jackie, how many do you have? 
Two. Two. So why don't we give the almoners to Shannon? Then, every, then it's a little more even. Consider, uh, since I've been on it, they haven't met. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Just one thing. Okay, so that leaves the almoners as Shannon, CPC as Jackie, Finance Committee as Shannon. Charlie has the three major departments. Master Plan is John, Norris School Committee, and the PQB is myself. Public Safety Complex is John, and ZBA is Jackie. So are you getting off the public? My hope, if we, do you want to go on to that discussion? Go ahead. My hope is to stay on the committee for the public safety complex, still chair it unless they want to reorganize, yeah. and just follow it through as it goes. Okay, and I'll okay. be the liaison uh, from the board. Okay. And, and gotcha. okay. part of it's because I've been there since day one. Right. I think it's important you stay on there. Okay. Okay. Everybody's all set then? Mm -hmm. Moving on, we're going to move on to um, a presentation by Todd Bard on solar net metering credits. Todd has visited the Board of Selectmen previously as an energy consultant and to help us choose a quote for electricity, and he's returned to discuss net meter credits for solar energy. Thank you, I Mr. Do. Bard. Thank you for uh, having me here tonight. Um, I had forwarded on some information, and I don't know if you guys have had a chance to uh, look at it, but solar net metering credits uh, are a way a uh, city or town or state agency or private company can utilize solar it doesn't have to be on site, so it can be remotely net metered. And I've done about 50 megawatts of these projects. So in the printout, a lot of my clients are there. So I've done a lot of municipalities, of state colleges as clients. So I try to find off takers who need and can utilize the net metering credits and then find a real project that actually is going to get built in the next three to six months, preferably. Sometimes they get delayed. Typically, it's by the utility company with the interconnect application um, and witness testing. So we have a project. Um, Lake Street Development has up in Deerfield. So it's going to be on a brownfield site. So it's a 30-acre solar system. Um, pretty much all the permits have been approved. The land lease is under contract for 20 years plus renewals. Um, the tax agreement is being negotiated now with the town of Deerfield and possible construction start date is 60 to 90 days away. And there's plenty of capacity in Eversource's territories to put the project in and to interconnect to their circuit. So some of the other off takers on this project, and then I'll go into the savings analysis and the spreadsheet, is Farmington River School District, which is up in Otis, um, Gateway Regional Schools in Huntington. The town of Deerfield will actually take about a little over 10% of the project. Um, town of East Hampton will be about 15 to 20% of the project. And then Central Berkshire Regional School Districts will be the other off taker. Um, I've got a couple other off takers that are interested in it outside of, of you, but probably one or two more off takers and then that whole project will be completed. 100% off take will be uh, procured. So if we can go to the um, National Grid um, invoice that I had forwarded over. This is, and I just want to let you know how credits actually transfer over. Um, so when a solar farm is built, it has a, a, a meter on site that actually registers all the generation. So for every kilowatt hour that's produced, it's registered with that account and it gets transferred as a dollar credit onto somebody's bill in that territory. So. Eversource has one territory. It's just all of Western Mass. So it's real easy to um, account for this. So once that meter's read, it's what's called Schedule Z, has everybody's offtake and accounts on there. So it would be the town of Southampton's, whatever accounts you wanted to put on there, school buildings, municipal buildings, um, DPW, wastewater treatment facility, whatever has the largest usage, those credits get transferred onto that bill instantaneously. So whenever you're meter is red, that dollar pays that bill. So in a perfect world, if it's a, let's say it's a $1,000 bill and $1,000 of credits transfer over, your balance would be zero. So you wouldn't have to pay anything to Eversource that month. And then the developer invoices you typically seven to 10 days later for something less than that $1,000. And in this case, it's 20%. 
So this project has a 20% discount. So for every dollar that he transfers over in credits, you only have to pay them 80 cents. Uh, quick, quick question. Yeah, qu ask okay. any questions. So whatever the bill is, if, it, if the energy is high at this month or low at that month, it's always 20% off that individual bill. Correct. It's, it's not off a, a certain level. Right. So there's two. So it's actual. Yeah. So John brings up a good point. So there's two ways that developers price their projects, either a fixed price, so per kilowatt hour, so it could be 8 or 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So it doesn't matter where pricing goes in energy f in the future, you're always going to pay that set kilowatt hour. Some have an escalator, so they put, might put a 1% escalator on it or 2%. This is just a fixed percentage off whatever the net metering tariff in Eversource. So if the power goes up to 20 cents, you're going to get 20% off of 20 cents. If power goes down to 10 cents, you're going to get 20% off of 10 cents. It's, it's, it's less risky. It's what I like for municipalities and school districts because I can try to remove a lot of the risk on the energy side. When you go with a fixed rate, it's who's going to be the smartest on where energy is going in the future. If you can get a really low, low price, like I did for Worcester State, um, it's working out perfect. Last year, that project I got them saved them $199,000 for the year. I just did a second project. It's going to save them another $300,000 a year. They have huge usage, you know, they're using 15, 18 million kilowatt hours, but next year they'll save a half a million dollars just by using these net meter credits on their electricity bills. So if you look at the bill um, where it says account balance, if you look where it says national grid services, the current, you just look at the current charges, it says $6,037.64. Then go to the next line, which says other supplier services, it's 10859 then you see the third column, it says adjustments. This is on the first page, page one of three. It's, you show, it shows a negative $12,923. And it says a total of $3,900. So their bill is actually, you know, 19000 roughly, but they only owe 4000 Actually, it's $17,000, but they only have to pay National Grid 3900 So we go to the last page there it shows supplier services so direct energy was their supplier and all the kilowatt hours they supply them they don't get any of the electricity from the solar project in fact that pro solar project is up in orange and worcester state of course is in worcester so below that you'll see other charges adjustments it says transfer credit charges that's the solar net metering credits they got transferred over instantaneously once that solar farm meter was read. So that 12923 which went on one of their meters, the developer will bill them, again, seven to ten days later. Typically, it's electronically. And you can pay them either electronically or by check um, for something less than that 12900 And that happens every month for 20 years plus renewals. So in our case, with this example, we'd receive roughly $2,500 discount. Correct. So 20% off of, of that number would be what you would be invoiced for, and then either electronically or by check be paid to the developer, which this developer, the name of the company is Lake Street Development. And so they're out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I did a project uh, with their previous company. Two of the members left that company called Urban Green Technology. That's the project I got for the town of Ware and Munson. And uh, these two guys left, started their own company, and now they're building solar projects here in Massachusetts. And this is the one that, this, is the, this will be their first project that they actually built on their own outside of their old firm. What happens if this company down the road goes belly up? Um, the developer can go bankrupt. It's the owner of the asset that really can't go bankrupt because they actually are generating profits. So they get the, what's called the SRECs, so the Solar Renewable Energy Certificates, which is the highest revenue source of a project. For the first 10 years, they're guaranteed those certificates. So on a six megawatt project, that'll probably produce almost 8,000 SRECs. And SRECs uh, at the floor right now through the auction DOER is $300. So simple math, you know, there's $2 million that's coming in off of those SRECs. Now the production of the energy is, if it's seven and a half million, let's just say it's 10 cents. So there's another three quarters of a million dollars. It's a lot of money that comes off of this project. So they'll always be producing money. As long as the sun is shining, every solar project actually makes money. 
Okay. Developers can go bankrupt, they can overextend themselves, but it's the owner of the project that we, that we care about. And those typically can never go bankrupt because unless they remove the asset, which by law they, they can't, but who knows what kind of games you know, owners can play down the road, but they're obligated to give the net meter and credits of that project to all the offtake. So they can't void the contract. And they're responsible for all the repairs, maintenance, upkeep, all yep. that. So they do all the maintenance. They pay all the property tax. Um, they pay the landlord the lease payments for the 20 years. Typically, the land leases are 30 years, mostly 20 years with a 10-year renewal. This one, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly if they do a 20 or 25 with a 5-year or, or a 10-year. So if, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. If we sign this contract, do we obligate the town to anything for decommissioning? Nope. Because in 10 years, the technology is going to change on this thing. That's almost a given. It, it, it changes, but incrementally. I mean, solar has been around for 40 years. The efficiency hasn't gotten that much better in those 40 years. Um, certainly, it, it's getting better. But to change the game, I mean, it would take an enormous scientist to come up with something that's I, better. I just don't want to lock the town into something if there is such a change and the thing needs to be decommissioned in 10 years. Yeah, no, you're not, That's you're not obligated I'm to. I'm not interested in them making a better product. I'm yeah. interested in. Well, you, you, you bring up a it. good point, though, because in, in the contracts that I help advise on, like this one, in there it says you'll take, let's say, 10% of the production. But what if somebody does come up with a technology that triples production in the same size panel, three and a half by five feet? Well, the contract says you have to take 10%. Well, you can't use triple the 10%. So we make sure that in the contract, if they want to triple the production, you have the first right to take additional credits. If you don't, it's the owner's problem to sell the additional credits. But I, I would have forgot that, so I, I appreciate that you brought that up. Is there termination clauses in there, either with cause or without cause? Um, that's something that you would talk to your lawyer again. Again, I, I get into the legal aspect a little bit. That kind of stuff you would want to be talking to the okay. lawyer about. But they can't terminate. And, and throw you off the project. Right. I'm looking more us because of what Charlie yeah. was saying. Yeah. Well, and v my understanding, vice versa. You could, let's say, a project came to you four years from now that was a 50% discount. You couldn't get out of the contract because you got a better deal with right. something else. Mm. You're, you're, you're obligated yeah. to it. Yeah. Jackie? Is there shorter contracts? I mean, do we have to have it such a long one? Can you turn your microphone? Oh, sorry. I was just saying, is there a shorter contract? Do we have to have such a long? Um, none that I've ever done. Hmm. Not to say developers don't offer that as an option. None of the projects that I've ever done for cities or towns or competed against were less than 20 years. Yeah, because it's a financing mechanism, yeah. these, when they go to equity investors, they want a 20-year. And it kind of mirrors the warranty of the solar panels. They're typically 20 to 25 years. And the land lease. Land lease, the first option of that land lease is 20 to 20. So every, everything is tied together. Hmm. Heather? Todd, just one thing. When we were speaking uh, a few weeks ago pertaining to this topic, we had mentioned that one of the concerns that often comes up with the town is they want to make sure that they're getting the best price and they don't want to sign up on something and then have a price come later. And you and I had discussed this and pretty much said that everything is the 20%. Or yeah, the 20%. It's not going to change. Everyone's on the same ballpark. Yeah, actually, this 20% is, is actually better than the previous projects I've, I've been on. So I did the town of West Springfield. That's a 5 megawatt. We just had the ribbon cutting yesterday in Southwick. So <coughs> Lieutenant Governor Polito came out and the Energy um, Department of Energy Resources chairman came out. Um, they're getting 13% discount, and, but they don't have any floor. So that project was kind of um, strange because it was going to go ISO New England. It was going to go wholesale power. And then developer called me last minute and said, can you find an off taker for this? And I'll give in the floor price. And so last minute, I brought it to West Springfield, and they jumped on it quickly. And that, that project there will save them about 120000 a year with, with, with absolutely no risk because it has no floor. This project has a floor, but it's mitigated low enough that it's not a concern of mine. And it's about the same floor that I did for Agawam and Longmeadow, and I did for Pathfinder Regional and Worcester State. So it's... Anywhere, if we can get a floor price of seven and a half to eight cents in Eversource's territory, that's a great floor. That means that if power falls to seven and a half cents, you don't save anything. As power goes up, you'll always save the 20%. So it squeezes that 20%. And that's a financing mechanism. 
So it's, 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 it's way to go to a bank and say, okay, if I didn't get SREX, then at least I know that I'm going to get X for my power. And that's how they come up with the floor price. Sort of like a fixed price. It's guaranteed the developer makes whatever that price is, $0.08 cents or $0.10, cents, and that guarantees you have to pay the $0.08 or $0.10. Cents. Same, same thing here. So with, with that floor, we don't get anything below $0.08. Cents. Right. Okay. So what is it at now? Um, all in, $0.13.3. Cents. When's the last time it went down to 8 Yeah. Uh, in the history of Eversource, never. In national grid territory, yeah. um, the lowest it's ever been. So supply. So let's break it out. So there's four charges on a on a solar project, you get the transmission charge, the transition charge, the distribution charge, and then the basic default service charge, which is the supplier charge. The supplier charge in national grid territory, which they're all pretty much roughly the same, in the last 20 years is 5.6 cents. So their fixed charges are 8.3. Eversource is about six, six and a half cents. So power would have to go to a penny and a half, and I just got you a price of almost 10 cents. So power would have to go down almost 80% for you to not save any money. Because your fixed costs never go down. Ever so, when, you, when you see a rate increase in the newspaper, unlike the recent one, that was a supply increase, is always a fixed cost rate increase. And that's to cover their overhead expenses, salaries, and health insurance, and pensions, and all that. Yeah, I don't know if you know the answer, but say it fell down to seven cents a, a kilowatt hour. What would be the difference between seven and eight cents for our usage that we so would that be would, losing? Good, good question. That'd be a penny. So a penny times half a million um, dollars. So you would actually lose five thousand dollars. Okay. So that's not still, not, that's still not doable. a lot of risk, but yeah, it's just. Well, I just wanted to quantify it. No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. How do you decide which? I mean, you have to choose a building to have your credits go. Excuse me. Have your credits go towards? How do you? How do we know which building has the highest usage? And if you choose a building and then we happen to get a public safety complex, is there a way to change where those credits go to? Great questions, yes. So you look for your biggest usage because you want as many credits going on in that as possible so you don't have it on 20 different accounts, even though you can put it on 100 different accounts. You want to use the biggest ones first. Um, and then what's called the Schedule Z, you can change that twice a year. So if credits are accumulating on one meter account, we can switch it to another one, or if you stop using power at a building, if you had to close a building, we can change that Schedule Z and put it onto a new building. So if you, put a, if you built a new building and you wanted power to go there, the credits, we could easily change that. Now with this, with so many off-takers, we want to coordinate that with all the off-takers because it's just twice. So whoever the host customer is, and on this one it's going to be the town of Deerfield, so in theory they could change it without telling anybody and then everybody else has one, but they'll know well before because the developer has to sign off on it, even though the host customer has the authority to sign it and send it in, but the developer has to approve the changes. So that developer would then contact me and say, hey, Todd, they want to do a change. I would then call all the off-takers and say, do you want to change? And in the first six months, I always call everybody. When you get your first bills, whoever is paying the bills or receiving the bills, they're going to have questions. I come back out, sit down, and say, okay, if there is an accumulation of credits, let's look at them and let's make some changes as quickly as possible. Especially if this one comes online um, the end of the year and you start getting credits and they accumulate, we want to change it for the first of next year. So we kind of even that out. Because once it's on there, Eversource doesn't have to write you a check. And so it might take you, you know, if it's in a few months, not a big deal if you eat those credits up. It's, if it sits there for a year, it's not a good use of, of money letting that credit sit on the account. So, so two changes a year, that's not Southampton. That's the total right. system. Two per project. Two per yeah. project per year? Per year, yep. So there's how many other participants in this? There, total, there should be six or seven. Okay, so. So everybody's got to make the changes at once, submit it. That's one change. The, okay. first, the first Schedule Z is counted one, which I don't, I don't understand why. So we can consolidate changes as long as we all know? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. If you were the only off-taker, you could change it twice on your own. And there's no way to consolidate our usage of, of all the meters to get, take advantage of this? No. It's, it's, it's meter and account-based. Okay. So if, if, if one building can take them all, then perfect world. 
And I don't no, think you I'm can. I'm not going there, yeah. <laughs> What's the potential savings per year for us uh, to do this? So the spreadsheet that I, I uh, sent over, so I, I use conservative numbers. I always uh, like to undersell it. So we're going to use a 10.5 cent um, tariff rate, even though it's 13 now. 20% um, off of that. And then that's see the floor price, you see 8 cents in that small rectangular box. So year one, it shows the 10.5, half a million kilowatt hours. Now your usage is like 770,000 kilowatt hours. So again, I use conservative numbers. Um, so the credits that will generate off that half a million kilowatt hours will be $52,500. Um, you are invoice $42,000 for that. Again, it's invoice monthly, but this is just showing a one time. So your savings for that first year is $10,500. And then it goes to the next year. As energy goes up, your savings go up. As energy goes down, your savings will go down. And over the next two years, I don't think um, energy going down is going to be a concern, unfortunately. Um, it's going to be spiked again next winter and potentially the winter after that. And is there a time frame for us to join this project? Um, yeah, yesterday, okay. <laughs> like all developers want. But um, in the next 60 days, and I always recommend, um, and I mentioned to Heather earlier, is getting one lawyer that represents all the off-takers. You share the cost of it, so not everyone has to have their own lawyer, take their own timeline. Um, and it's comfort in numbers. I do that for all my off-takers, is just get one. He, he gives you the exact same contract, and then you just plug in your numbers, which I would help you plug in those numbers. And then whoever has to sign off on it, signs off on it, and then it gets sent to the developer. And then one lawyer is talking to the developer's lawyer, ne oops, negotiating the legal side of it. Um, I would recommend Jeff Fialke out of Bacon and Wilson. He's done a lot of work with a lot of cities, cities and towns. He did Ware and Munson's. He did um, Agalom's. Um, and I think he did Pathfinders, which I'm pretty sure he did that one too. Um, and he, he does a lot of this law. And it's a little bit complicated, so you got to kind of know what you're doing. Um, so he would be the one that I would, and I've recommended him to all the other ones. You know, if you have your own lawyer that wants to review it, I'm fine with that, but I would have him um, represent uh, all of you. So these numbers are based on the kilo hours used in this building? No, in total of all your facilities. Okay. So you, you would look at taking, you know, roughly a little over 60% of what you use. I always like to use 60 to 70%. Because if you do energy efficiency or you close a building, because once you sign a contract for half a million kilowatt hours of credits, you're obligated to take that. Now, if you look in year one, it's half a million, but look in year 20, 433,000. So solar panels produce less electricity every single day. So there's a degradation factor. I use a high degradation factor of 0.75. It's typically 0.25%. So we do have some safety mechanism in, the, in there. If you're growing as a community, I would then say be a little bit more aggressive and take maybe 70, 75 percent. Worcester States, you know, they're being really aggressive because they, they're going to be expanding even more. They're, they're taking 80 percent of their load. That's why, you know, they're saving half a million dollars a year. So did you say this 500,000 kilowatt hours is for the total town of Southampton? Yes, just for all the municipal buildings. And we can only go on one building, one meter of that whole system, correct? No, you can go on, we can put 10 of your accounts on, 15 of your accounts. Oh, I thought you said just one account we can, we can do as part of this, what I no, asked no. before. No, I, I then, I misspoke then. Okay, so. Because no, you can go, you can, Schedule Z, you can have as many accounts as you want on it. So we'll take look, all of our one meters. In the perfect world, if, if, if one account can take half a million okay. kilowatt hours. So I'm glad you said that, because I misunderstood yeah, I that. I know, because I was thinking one building. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, then no, I'm trying I, to I figure out how to get, no. Like, wouldn't this be beneficial to the school? Yeah. I mean, they so, probably would use more yeah. energy well, that, than all like the other south, buildings. Like in East Hampton, the bulk of theirs is going to go to their high school. Their right. high school is a huge consumer. They don't get solar. They have a little tiny solar system up on their roof, but it's just more for um, perception than, than anything else. Um, but the bulk of it's going there. Their, their solar system that's on their landfill um, is going to other municipal buildings. So they have, a, they have a big need for more net metering credits. 
Okay, just, just to beat the horse and to clarify for all of us. So if we decide to join, we can take our local school, the town hall, the new safety yep. complex, yada, yada, and yep. consolidate it? Yes. Okay. Yep. That, that sounds and then how do you better. decide how many credits go back to each department? Um, I'll look at the baseline. So whatever kind of the lowest month is, we want to make sure that we can use those credits in the lowest months because in the highest months, we really don't care about. It's the lowest months, so then credits don't roll over month after month. So like rollover minutes, I kind of use that as, a, as an example. They'll continue to roll over. Once a credit goes on your bill, it stays there in the perpetuity. But you don't want to use them today and, and buy them today and not use them for 19 years. It's not a good use of your money. So we want to make sure that, you know, at least within three months, you're utilizing them. The, the issue we have is schools and a lot of buildings are closed in the summer. It's when solar projects makes the most electricity. So it's using no energy, and you're accumulating all these net metering credits. So we want to know that by September, it's going to start to eat up a lot of that credit. So we don't want them sitting there for six to nine months. So we look at the baseline, what your lowest months are, and then apply the credits to that, and then diversify among multiple accounts. Okay. So if they do sit there, we don't lose them, like no, no, no. some rollover minutes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yep. They'll stay there forever. And that's why, and I talked to Heather, if I continue to help you get your supply energy, is it all, all the supply costs have to stay on your Eversource bill? Because if, Ever, if Eversource bills here, and let's say direct energy gets your supply over here, credits cannot pay that bill. Credits, which I love that the DOER and the DPU did this, is the credits can only pay a dollar on an Eversource or a National Grid or an NSTAR bill. It can't go to a separate supplier, because then there could be really shell games that are happening. So everything is regulated here. And that's one of the things that the utility companies do good at, is the meter reads and the accounting. Is there a downside then with staying with Eversource, as I, you see going in the future? I, we have no choice. Okay. Eversource, that's the, that's the only utility. So we can't use another supplier that? Oh, yeah, you, you know, the supplier you can change all the time. Okay. It's Eversource is Wamico. Okay. That's yeah. why I, I use yeah, it. Right. So yeah, we can change direct, Constellation, but okay, we, so we can do we price that. Them, we just say you have to put it on the Eversource. Bill. Okay, you, their good. cost. I thought you were saying we couldn't use those folks. Yeah, no, no. Okay, you can any, use any supplier. And then what's the cost to us? Like, is this a free for us to join? Is yeah. there any? There's no other. Just, a, so just, just your legal costs. No upfront investment. Just your time and energy to vet this project and to you know hash out what you think is best for the town of Southampton and then the accounts. And then just whatever the legal fee is for one six or one seventh of the off take. Okay. That's really it. Speaking, of, you calling off takers? That we should. Yeah, off takers. Yeah. Okay. How do we get a a list of those folks so that if we want to go forward, we can have our town administrator contact them? Absolutely. Yep. Just one question, Todd. In your experience, what is the average cost for the compiled legal services? Um, typically two to three thousand in total. So it's, okay. it's not a lot, you know. I've seen, you know, some huge ones, but that's out towards the Boston here. Do you yes. want to make a motion to authorize Heather to move forward with the uh, legal review? Is that an acceptable motion? Well, go ahead and make it, and we'll see. Go ahead. All right, I move that uh, we authorize the town administrator to move forward on the legal review of this project. And a report back to the board. Yeah. I'll second that for discussion. Any other discussion? So legal review meaning just talk to the other member, the other outliers or whatever? Uh, the outliers, talk to the, the attorney that seems to be representing them, okay. see if there's any pitfalls that we're not aware of, and get back to us. And okay. soon, so that we can get on board. Right. And feel free to you. call, ask any questions, email me. You know, that's, a, that's what I'm here for. I, I want to make sure that everybody's comfortable and mm. has enough education to, to make the proper decision. Now, you're getting whatever your revenue source from somebody else's end, I guess the best way to yeah, put Yeah, so right. I get my, my consultant fee comes from the developer. Okay. But I represent the off-takers. Okay. Well, so. so there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So, Todd, when you said 60 days, what would you Um, as long as we have an open dialogue, you know, you and I talking or any of the board members, as long as it's moving forward, that, that's good. But 
certainly at the next board meeting, if you guys, if it's ready to be approved and approved, that's plenty of time. Yeah, I, I would think as we talk with the other outtakers, we'll all come to hopefully the same decision, right. same time. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think talking to the others will yeah. bring anything. Yeah. Oh, I don't have to look at my agenda to know that it must be time for the town administrator's report. <laughs> it Go is. Ahead, Heather. It is. All right. So a couple of things we have going on right now. First was on Thursday, I was able to attend a free conference in Worcester in carpool, so it didn't cost the town anything for me to attend. Um, for the Combi's Expo. Combi's is the new system on the WEM that represents all of the state contracts that you can look you into. There? I was there. I was there too. Oh, and John, we could have carpooled as well. Look at that. So it, it was a very interesting day. One of the questions I actually asked the gentleman, I believe his name is Eric Murphy, who's the head of the Combi's, I had talked to some of his workers when we were doing the training and they weren't able to clearly explain something to me. And that was the question we keep having, which is, if we utilize one of these state contracts and the cost is over $10,000, hence triggering 30B, do we still have to proceed with the normal bidding process or receiving additional quotes or what have you? And the answer is generally no. The state has already gone through all of this process of 30B in procuring each of these state contracts. Each contract section, so IT, vehicles, what have you, they have their own guidebook to them. You do have to read the individual guidebook for that section of contracts. And some of them say you still need to grab one or one to three quotes or prices on the Combi's website. But in general, by utilizing Combi's, we can bypass the rest of the steps required in 30B, which was one of the major questions we had. Um, especially moving forward with looking to purchase a new vehicle for the water department. So that was very helpful. We also were able to do a bunch of networking and some additional classes and get some information there. One of the state contractors was present, which was WB, who we already utilized. What we didn't realize is they also sell water that we currently buy from Poland Springs and have for the past several years. The cost from W.B. Mason is about $5 cheaper per bottle and $2 cheaper per rental unit, and we don't pay $3 for shipping. So we are looking at switching over to W.B. Mason. That will save us approximately $849 annually, which I was really excited about. Um, so we're working on that. When we actually called Poland Springs, they attempted to match us, but it was a little irritating at the fact that we've been struggling with them for years and no one ever said that they'd match prices. So the next thing is we've been working very hard once we finish the budget and the warrant on financial policies in the audit, which we are starting to get into the process of reviewing the management letter and the financial statements. One of the comments that come up that they really wish to see a strategic turnover procedure a detailed process of what happens with all the financial transactions and including the purchasing system a little bit more as well. We are under the belief that we can adopt good systems from other communities and that is what we started to do. We actually found a policy that Hubbardson had and we started working with it. We've currently met once or twice at this point, I think it was twice. We're meeting again tomorrow, myself, Vicki, Donna, and someone from finance to continue reviewing the policies. We're only on about page 12 of 47 pages, but it's very comprehensive and I think it's very detailed and a great guide for departments to understand really what they need to do and what things are. It also does a fantastic job of giving layman's terms to definitions of free cash and capital stabilization and what you can use things for, what you can't, and if you do go to town meeting, the vote amounts. So we found that very helpful. And we're still working through that, but we're hoping that this will answer a lot of the auditor's concerns pertaining to some of those matters. Next thing we've been working with is just the responses to the management letter for the auditors in the first place. Vicki and I met today. We find, think we're in the finalized stage of those. We just have to proofread them. And then we'll put them on letterhead and present them to the Board of Selectmen at one of the next meetings for a signature by the board. At that point, we'll then talk about setting up a meeting with the auditors to come in and just discuss the management letter. Again, a lot of the concerns they had were the same as the past years, but there are different members on the board, so not everyone may be apprised of them. The next thing is the annual town report. 
We're almost finished it. We overhauled the entire project this year from every year in the past using a template from another community in, I believe it was Town of Weston for this one. I truly believe in using the resources others have already created and modifying them as needed. So we're in the process of finishing that up. We're actually doing an FAQ page at the back, which is almost done, and really the biggest piece is looking at the table of contents and checking with both the town treasurer and the accountant to make sure I didn't accidentally change any numbers unintentionally. Uh, the last piece, the, or second to last piece, the budget and the warrant are completed and they're just waiting for our constable to pick them up. He has plenty of time. We're required by law to have it posted seven days prior to the annual town meeting. So he's coming to pick it up and get sworn in tomorrow and that would be Officer Goyette. The last piece is payroll. That was another piece that had been touched in the auditor's management letter. And the concern was we currently do not have either the technology for a software system nor just an Excel sheet that actually compiles every individual who works for the town, their current pay rate, their current step if they're on a step, what union they're in, additional information including how much vacation, personal and sick time. Every year it's as if we're starting from scratch again. This year what I'm trying to push the effort to do is to actually have one sheet of paper for each individual that the individual receives. So as an employee I would receive a paper, it says my name, I put my name, my title, put my current pay rate. If I'm on a step I say what step I'm on, how many vacation days I get, how many sick time, personal time I get. And then it goes back to the treasurer and the auditors to essentially audit the numbers. Make sure our records match with the individuals. If they don't match, that's a problem. Either because someone didn't keep up with paperwork somewhere along the line or because people are under the misconception that they have certain time that they don't have. So this allows us to make sure all of the systems match. Each individual would have one sheet of paper unique to their name that would go in their personnel file. So we have a tracking of the system and I think it would also help with the auditors. It would also assist us in future years when we're trying to project additional costs and what the actual cost of just salaries are if there is a pay step increase. What the numbers would be right now having to shoot at the hip isn't helping us. That's all I have actually for that. I just got one comment going back to the OSD contracts. Yep. Uh, they let you go bypass 30B. Some of them, especially the IT that you mentioned, it seems like you could use those for IT for laying cable and all that but you can't they don't let you go by chapter 30 or chapter 149 so if you're laying cable or anything like that it has wages in there but you've got to have prevailing wages and you actually have to bid it out over ten thousand dollars I think most of the contracts my my understanding I haven't looked at a lot of them but they have guidebooks right. and I imagine it would give you the parameters of that well not all of them because I was, I was talking to the AG this morning about that what we read versus what the actuality was was different so just if you get into okay. the IT contract holler okay right now we're buying software yeah you're good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you um, we have select board updates and liaison reports school committee is meeting tomorrow night um, to approve the amount that was asked for yesterday for the article on the town warrant and the PQB is almost finished with the bylaws so they'll be presenting them to us very shortly anybody else I'm going to a CPC meeting tomorrow night okay I'm just trying to see when the next public safety is you remember the next public safety committee meeting is going to be after town meeting because that will influence where that's going. This Thursday morning we are going to do see some soil work on the site. You'll see some uh, white ribbons out there. Basically we're going to dig into the area where the proposed building is going to be and the driveways just to establish what types of soils there are. We've done the whole parameter and came up with heavy clays in that. So I suspect it's going to be probably the same. Uh, Charlie, too, if, if you look, you'll see those flags are not in your wetlands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Uh, actually, I have one more thing. Um, regarding Angel Heart Monument, we have 20 families now um, that have pavers in front of the monument and two new pavers are going in. 
Um, they've been engraved and they should be going in uh, this week or next week. Excellent. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. We have open time for the public. Mr. Thoreau. I have some questions. Okay. So, Ready. Good evening. Uh, Mark Thoreau, 100 Pleasant Street. I'm here tonight to express my concerns uh, of the lack of both fire and EMS coverage at night uh, within the town of Southampton. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, I'm a full-time firefighter paramedic, have been for over 20 years. For the past 18 months, I uh, work for the town of Southampton uh, until last Wednesday uh, when I resigned. Uh, the reasons for which are not important for tonight's discussion. Um, I'm here for a few reasons. Number one is that uh, the nighttime call coverage um, is pretty much non-existent for this month. Uh, when I first started with the Southampton Fire Department 18 months ago, uh, there was call teams. People were assigned. You knew what nights you were on call. If you couldn't make those nights, you made arrangements to have someone work for you. At some point, um, since the uh, current chief took over, that system went by the wayside. Uh, it pretty much came down to just sign up whenever you feel you want to. Uh, since then, there's been a free-for-all. Uh, people sign up. They then get overtime in their full-time jobs. They take their name off. They leave early. Uh, we've had several times where there's been calls and people that were supposed to be on uh, did not respond. In um, talking with some members that have, were on the fire department years ago, uh, bless you, the uh, <coughs> general consensus was that there were more members uh, responding to calls than were needed. Um, now we have, in some cases, absolutely nobody. Um, over the last four months, uh, the month of February, there was two nights of no coverage. Uh, in March, there were eight nights of no coverage. Um, in April, there are nine nights of no coverage. And in, so far in May, um, there are 24 nights where there is not coverage. And that may be there's either nobody on or there's only one person on. Uh, so if there's only one person on, we need to utilize mutual aid. Um, I have a copy of the schedule I'd like to give you. Can I write on here? It's yours to keep. <clears throat> it would seem that uh, in doing away at the call uh, team system and just essentially going to a free-for-all, uh, there's, there's, there's a lack of management. Uh, there, there's absolutely no oversight there. People are free to come and go as they please. As part of... Uh, the town's responsibility and obligation as a basic level ambulance service, you need to send an ambulance out the door 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That does, has nothing to do with your ALS license or the current problems that you're having with your ALS license. Um, th this is a safety hazard, uh, and I, I think this needs to be brought up to the department uh, the o of OEMS. If, if we can't staff an ambulance, then uh, maybe we should look to outsource it to a neighboring community, someone else uh, that will be able to fulfill the obligation. Do, do you think it's strictly based on a team versus a sign-up uh, type of system? Uh, no, I think it's a uh, lack of management and it's employees who have become disengaged. Uh, it's is what I think the problem is. And, it, and it, to give you a, uh, an example in comparison, uh, the town of Granby, very similar in size population-wise. Um, they do so maybe 300 more calls a year than us. They have uh, staffed their day shifts, and they have been on, had on-call night shifts at the paramedic level for at least 10, if not 15 years. Do you know if they do teams or they do sign-ups? I, I don't know how it works over there, but I know it's, it's, it's call at night and it's staffed during the day. And, and, and I don't know if it's, uh, I'm sure it's not without some problems, but I'm sure it's not 25 nights uh, of, of non-existent coverage. So do you think the EMTs, paramedics are not responding or not signing up 
because of their perception of mismanagement? I think with uh, all of the turmoil over the last few months that have gone on, um, I think people have taken a step back. And I know there's a, uh, an override vote for $135,000 to man a second shift. Um, I will tell you I am against that. I don't think that's necessary. I think what needs to happen is better management. Um, if, if the town of Granby can do it, then the town of Southampton should be able to do it. There are other communities that are called during the night, they staff during the day, and they're able to pull it off. I guess one question in my mind and it has always been, you've got this group of dedicated professionals over here, and you've got a disconnect maybe at the fire department for whatever reason, you know, perceived or true. Wouldn't the EMTs and paramedics come in to help the community and put aside the issues of, say, perceived mismanagement because they want to help the townspeople? It seems like it hurts the townspeople more it, than it... It certainly does hurt the townspeople. And I think at, at, at some point, uh, people have made the decision uh, that it's just not worth it uh, at this point. Um, and, and I will tell you, I, do you, what is your contingency plan if this uh, $135,000 uh, doesn't go through? And so now in June, July, August, we're open 20 nights a week, 25 nights a week. What is your plan uh, for the citizens of the town to provide ambulance service? Well, I think at this point, you know, our, our job during open time for the public is to take your concerns and to take them into consideration and have conversations about them. I don't think it's a time for us to say, here's what our plans are and give you an answer okay. to anything that's happening. Okay. So <clears throat> I guess um, in watching the select board meetings of the 14th and the 16th of April, um, it, it, it would appear that maybe there was con some confusion. Um, the ALS agreement that the town signed with the state um, you're aware that that doesn't mean you have to staff at the fire station, correct? That means that just like in the town of Granby, typically the department staff during the day because people uh, who years ago worked in the communities that they uh, lived in live out of town and they can't respond to calls. And so that's why um, most communities will staff during the day, but those people are home at night and they're able to, to uh, respond. Um, <clears throat> so from a uh, theoretical standpoint, if you had enough people that lived in town, you could be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So based on that, to spend um, $135,000 to do something that we were able to do until just a few months ago, that seems really foolish to me, to spend that kind of money when we, weren't a few, we were getting the job done up until a few months ago for, for no more money than what the current budget is. And now we have to spend $135,000 to make this happen until 10 at night. So my question is next year, are you gonna come back to the townspeople looking for another $135,000 because you can't staff the third shift? I mean, wh where does this end? So we'd be looking at $270,000 for something we were doing for whatever the fire budget is today. That just seems crazy to me. And then my last uh, question I have is um, on the fire chief's residency. Um, it's my understanding that he still does not live in town, uh, that he is renting a house in East Hampton. Um, it has also been brought to my attention that uh, perhaps his wife uh, needs to live in South Hadley for her job as emergency manager. Um, has that been looked into at all? I will tell you that we have looked into all of those things. The Board of Selectmen is currently having conversations about them in executive session, and at this point, we're not ready to make a statement about any decisions that may or may not have been made. Okay. <clears throat> I guess my last point is um, on just a few days ago, May 1st, there was a call for a fire alarm activation with smoke. It was a uh, laundry room fire at 128 College Highway which is the uh, elderly complex. Um, it's my understanding that not one firefighter responded. What time was the call? Uh, 8.51. A.M.? P.M. P.M. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thrill. Is there anyone else that would like to speak during open time for the public?
Mr. M Mr. Rancourt, would you please approach the podium so everyone at home can hear you? What has happened to the? Uh, You're talking to that. Sorry. Over. <laughs> what happened to the uh, volunteer fire department we had in this town? It was a Class A act. I mean, it, it was really well work, worked out. We had a lot of volunteers. You know, pardon the English. What the hell happened? Maybe we got to take a look into that. You know, if we step backwards, at least we'd still have coverage, as this gentleman said, at night. These volunteers. I guess your answer that you just gave is appropriate here. Which which one? The one that says we, we know that there's something we're actively working on, and at this point, it's not something that we can comment. Well, I'm talking about the past. All right. Yeah. I think there's obviously some changes that have happened that need to be addressed by the board of selectmen. I think so. Yeah. I think it's overdue. I concur. Thank you. At this point, we will move on to um, number five, Mrs. Walunas, because I know you're following nu numerically, um, the operating procedures and policies for the Board of Selectmen. Heather's handed out copies of policies and procedures that are used by Harvard Mass and, many and may accomplish what we're looking to accomplish by having more formality. Um, Heather could add a few comments to this, and I will say that this is one thing that Heather and I sometimes disagree about is the formality of the meetings. and. Um, following a certain procedure. My own opinion, although I know I'm not supposed to give it, is that I like to hear from people um, in the audience. And so I, I feel like lending ourselves to a very formal approach may not work best in Southampton. However, that's for the board to decide. So, Heather. Great introduction, Liz. Thanks. So again, going back to the borrowing concept, because we like to use good things that already exist as our templates. Town of Harvard has a Board of Selectmen policies and procedures, and the reason we brought this one up was because I think this really mirrors what Liz is going at, which is a little more formality, but nothing too, too strict to really bind us. A few things, or few things other folks have are parliamentary procedures or other things called Robert's Rules of Order. In this document, they actually reference Robert's Rules, but only whenever there is a concern or a question of how to proceed with a definition of something. Otherwise, it's pretty much just the standard. They're giving you an instruction of really where they're going with the purpose, that they're just trying to attempt to create more formality and codify the traditional and accepted working relationships among the members of the board, between the board and the town administrator, and the board and other town boards, committees, officials, and citizens, and also recognizing the needs, need to systemize and reduce to writing the town's public policies and procedures hereby undertake, and then they go into the operating procedures. They talk a little bit about different things. One of them is just adopting procedures. Um, under their procedure for establishing policies and procedures, the thing I really like about it is they actually say the town administrator will be responsible for implementation of all policies and procedures. It doesn't have to be me, but the purpose of this line is saying the board has created a policy. This is who's going to enforce that policy instead of having to come back to the board and saying, Sally, Sally's in violation of the policy. How does the board wish to proceed? This gives some more direction as to what the board wishes to do. They talk about election and qualification. Um, they also go into the organization of the board, which we just did this earlier this evening, and this pretty much models what we did for our process. Meeting procedures tells you how things will proceed. A quorum shall consist of three members of the board. We already know that, but this codifies it for us. As a practical courtesy, action on critical or controversial matters, the adoption of policy or appointment shall be taken whenever practical, practicable with the full board in attendance. Actions and decisions shall be made by motion, second, and vote. Split votes will be identified by name. Again, we do this, but this really gives a guideline. If, from five years from now, if no one on this board is currently here and there's no one to explain to everyone else how this goes, this already says this is the direction the board is going in. This is what the board does. They talk about executive sessions and how to go in them, agenda procedures. They go into appointments and how they would fill the appointments, which is a phenomenal thing because I have to tell you how much time the town clerk and I have spent in an office looking at each other trying to figure out what our official procedure is to make an appointment to a vacancy. So can I say that I, I understand what your, your point is, and 
can we, you all have a copy of this, read through it line by line and put this on as something that we talk about and adopt over the summer when it's a slow time for we, us? We can do it whenever the board wishes. We're actually getting into a slow time because we're finishing right. the annual town meeting, which concludes meant, like on the June. 19th. Like June. That's fine. I just want to make sure this doesn't become something that goes to the back burner. We were initially supposed to follow up with this in February, and then we got tied up with the budget. Right. Can we schedule, schedule, can we schedule a meeting it? in the future so that we'll have a time? Mm-hmm. So we can do the first meeting in June if that works for everyone. What is that? Are we meeting? I have no up? idea. Okay. When that is? First meeting in June. We have a, we have a schedule already. We do. Mm -hmm. Is this put into our packet already? Is this, I'm sorry, what's that, Charlie? Is this in our packet as a Word uh, document? It is not, I don't believe. I can send it to it you. in a Word document, that way. It's a PDF right now, but if I send it to you and you convert it to a Word, we can send it out. Okay. So I guess I'm a full service organization. let's put this on our meeting for June 2nd. At that point, I would expect that everyone has read it and underlined the parts that they agree with or disagree with. Um, so that we're not looking at it and saying sure, because I'm sure at some point someone's going to read something that they don't agree with. So but June 2nd. I, I think this is a great idea, and giving this will get it through a lot quicker. Thanks. One thing just to note on this that I really admired was the fact that they, is, they attach all of their current policies that they have in place. One of the problems they're running into is the Board of Selectmen has adopted various policies in writing over the years. They're not in one place. They're all over the place. Sometimes I don't know if it's ever been reconsidered, ever looked at, but I would, my thought would be if the board decides to proceed with something like this, that any policy that they currently feel should be enforced should be attached to this document, and then it can be reviewed annually with additional policies needed and added to it. That way also, if you're an employee or a department head and you're asking, hey, what's the, what's the policy on um, winter days? What's the policy on working from home, whatever it is, it's all in this document. They're not hoping they have the correct version like we've been doing with the PPPB's documents for the past year and a half. And I think it should be on the website too when it's done. And a caveat on the end of it should be that any document that's not attached to this document and approved is null and void. So we can have all those conversations. Could you have a copy of the policies that we have currently? All the ones I've found? Yeah. I can. Thanks. Um, next, we have the establishment and reestablishment of the following committees. These are placed on the agenda for consideration, but um, we're going to move it to the 19th. Uh, really? That's the annual town meeting. Yes. Well, we well, can we move it after that if we need to. Do you want to move say, it to June we having, 1st? Oh, we're not having a meeting on the We generally night. meet on that night before the annual town meeting. We meet a little earlier in case there's any things that have to be How about be we put considered. that on June 2nd? we Will do. Thanks. Um, that would move us to 5.3, which is a request that received on April 22nd from Sonny Kozak of 74 Russellville Road to have a 60-day extension on the order from the Board of Selectmen to register or remove cars within 90 days of receipt of this letter, which was December 22nd, 2014. The letter was delivered to Mr. Kozak by the police, police post office on January 28, 2015. Um, just a little background on this. The, in December, the Board of Selectmen held a hearing to hear a special permit application for Mr. Kozak, who currently housed more than one unregistered car on his property. The town bylaw prohibits such action, apps, prohib, prohibit such action absent the granting of a special permit by the Board of Selectmen or physical shelter over such vehicles. Abutters were present at the hearing, and the Board of Selectmen determined that the applicant shall have 90 days from receipt of written notice to remove the cars. Days before this date arrived, Mr. Kozak submitted a letter to the Board of Selectmen to request an extension. Abutters have been notified of tonight's meeting, as well as Mr. Kozak. Hi, ma'am. Are you an abutter? I'm Okay, thank you. Would you like to have... I'd just like to ask... Would you, yep, would you please come to the podium? I'm Doris Rumel. I live on 78 Russellville Road. And uh, I'd just like to add uh, one comment. Instead of removing cars, he added another one, unregistered. Mm -hmm. So it is like right now, three cars visible 
unregistered. So I was going to ask how much movement has there been, but. Um, you know, it's very difficult to tell what he does, but in the front of the house where I drive by, what I see, I just can tell you that there was one car added instead of taken away. And what he does in the back, I have no clue. So you're not the neighbor down that long No, driveway. I am on 78. I live next door to next John. Door. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I drive by that property all the time. And uh, as you know, we try to keep our homes right. uh, decent up there. And he seems to uh, not make any efforts. I can just say that he added a car. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So where, how would the, light, the board like to proceed with this? Would you like to grant him an extension? At, a 60-day extension, a 30-day extension, no extension? I would make a motion not to grant any extension and to move forward with bringing a complaint in housing court relative to the violation. Okay. I'll, se I'll second it for discussion. So. Okay. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. What's the cost to the town if you open this in housing court? Probably nothing. What I would do is basically, if you'd authorize the town administrator to go with me, We'd file a complaint and basically bring him to court, get it mediated, and get a court order that if he disobeys the court order, he's in contempt of court. But those initial actions usually are free. Okay. Are you saying this is housing court? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Heather, do you have any other suggestions? I don't have any other suggestions, just in line with um, what Doris had said. I actually received a call from Ian Abutter earlier today. He also was unable to be here tonight because he's out of town. He had the same concerns. And I'm not sure if he was the same gentleman who called me about a week before I received this letter saying he was concerned because things hadn't moved any which direction. Um, Mr. Kozak himself was unable to be here this evening because he had to work. Okay. So I look at it this way. He was given 90 days. It's going to take at least a month to process before it goes to court. If he sees he's going to court, he may comply with the order. At that point, we just dismiss the case. Yeah. And I guess the part that distresses me is that he's adding to the collection rather than taking away. So. Yeah. Okay. So could you repeat the motion so we're all clear about what it is? Either Emily or Charlie. I think we're going to need Charlie to repeat could it. We've repeat got about half. Just so I know there's a motion and a second, but so we're all on the same page. I moved that the town of Southampton bring court action relative to this in housing court, authorizing the town administrator and myself representing the Board of Selectmen to move this forward. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Charlie? Aye. Thanks. So there's no extension being granted and we'll move forward um, with court. You may want to take and send him a letter to that effect notifying him. Can you draft that, Heather? Thanks. May, may I say something candidly? Sure, you're on TV. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> what happens with these types of situations is, is you empower them by constantly giving them, you know, more extensions, more extensions. Somewhere down the line, you gotta say stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what the board of selectmen is saying. Stop. Right. He was given enough um, warnings. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we have no appointments at this time. We have no PCFs Thank or you. PRFs. Thank you, Mrs. Umel. Um, we have an application for a one-day beer and wine permit for Conant Park requested by John and Christy Parzik for a party on Sunday, June 14th, 2015 from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Payment application, Conant Park rental agreement and waiver have all been submitted. Um, the one-day license is ready to be signed. Are there any questions from the board? Hearing none, I would accept a motion to sign the one-day alcohol license I'll make the motion oh so moved is there a second is there a second I'll make a second <laughs> all I those Jackie would speak any well. other discussion no. never <laughs> all those in favor aye aye there's 74 Russell Road as you can see it's is that current view well it'll be a year ago oh, okay 
We are now down to a letter from the Greenway Committee. This is a request for use of DLTA funds from PVPC to provide an engineering assessment for the Greenway. Uh, it says Charlie too on my notes, but I'm sure that that's not what she meant to put. <laughs> that's what I meant to put. <laughs> Yes. Uh, to further, we, uh, hold on one second, Charlie. I'm sorry, Charlie. Uh, on our board committee's departments, we don't have the Greenway on here, should we? Um, I guess we could add that going back. I think you're talking about the Greenway negotiation. No, I'm just talking about both of them in general. I don't think we had anyone on the Greenway in the first place. It was just the Greenway negotiation oh, committee. But Dora can talk to that when we get to okay. the next section. Right. Okay. So go ahead, Charlie from CONCOM is here to present and explain our letter. Okay, basically we need two signatures. In, in proceeding with the negotiations with the railroad, we are going to have to go through an envir environmental assessment and also an engineering assessment. As you know, once we purchase this corridor, we will be in ownership of two bridges, one over Gun Road and one over the river, <clears throat> a trestle over the river. So the procedure um, we follow has been to get uh, technical assistance from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And they have, in the past, about a year ago, if not longer, uh, investigated the options we had for the environmental assessment. And they identified a preferred uh, service provi provider, Tigan Bond, and Dork, uh, Dork, uh, Dork, I, I knew a, I have a, a Korean friend named Dork. Dork <laughs> is, uh, has, has proceeded with getting this revamped and we have an example of the document we'd like a signature on. In addition to that, we are uh, in, involved in preliminary discussions of the environmental assessment the, uh, I should say, the engineering assessment, the environmental assessment is approximately 3,000 in cost, $3,100. The uh, environmental uh, assessment will be more substantial. And we're working with, again, PVPC to uh, have a full uh, uh, evaluation of candidates, a request for performance and those uh, procedures that enables us to pick someone both, uh, both based on competency as, as, <clears throat> as well as price. We can, via this process, actually take someone more expensive if we have the collective judgment of the negotiating team and the Greenway Committee and the CONCOM uh, that such a, such a provider would be available, would be best for us. Um, so basically, we're here for two, two signatures. Dork will uh, maybe expand on the Tigan bond issue. <clears throat> this is the one we spoke about last week, so I'm hoping it's familiar to you all now. Charlie, you didn't have the benefit of the thing at the time, but the long and short of it is that long ago, Tigan bond had been the successful bidder, uh, successful by way of being not only qualified, but by far the lowest price for the environmental phase one study specifically. They re-upped the quote, which was basically held to the 20, um, I think it's 2012 numbers, I've actually kind of forgotten, plus a small upcharge for an adjustment that they have to pay on a service that's necessary in the performance of the contract. So in effect, they held the price, which was nice of them. Um, let's see, I, I hope you've had a chance to look over the document then and hope that you've not found anything unsuitable about it. And that is specifically the phase one, which is the, the bare minimum environmental survey that you would do and what happens after that depends what they find on the phase one. The money for all of this is all taken care of. There's no, I mean. So, so far. Upgrade. You may remember that in, um, again, 2012, if, if memory serves me, we were allocated about 39.5, I think is the right, right figure, for handling the expenses of the transaction. Uh, at this point, it's not clear whether that's going to be quite enough, but it's close. And at least the uh, environmental survey itself is well covered by the money we have so far. Okay. We had asked Heather to take a look at this um, and have it reviewed, which she did, and there's no problems with anything in the contract. I've got a question on that. Yep. Uh, who, who reviewed this, Heather? 
I, I just took a look at it. We generally don't send things out to legal counsel unless necessary. This is their standard 2009 contract that hasn't been updated since. We've been using tie and bond for as long as I can remember going back in history. They are a reliable yep. a company. I did look at the in indemnification clause that I know you had a concern with last week. It's a standard boilerplate clause. There's no concern with it. I had to read it twice because <laughs> the first time it threw me off and I thought they were saying something they weren't saying. And Dork and I went over it together, but I have no concerns with it. Well, let me just ask a question. There was five indemnification clauses. I know two said to the extent permissible under mass law, which is great. I, I work on the state end of it, and mm -hmm. it's illegal to indemnify a third party from where I am. So I'm not sure if in a city and town we can legally indemnify a third party. So if, if there's any anything that comes up to the illegal effect, what generally ends up happening is it can be separated from the rest of the contract and everything else continues forward and is enforceable. It seemed like from their piece, um, I don't know if they were per se saying third parties as much as they were saying if we hire Peter and one of Peter's workers, one of his own consultants is Joe, that they're keeping us out of the liability end as well on that piece for their negligence. I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I would suggest and what I'm used to doing is in the three indemnity clauses that don't say to the extent allowed under mass law, insert that at the beginning of the paragraph so that protects us. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't think they're going to let us change their contract because it's their, their formalized contract that they use for everything. I don't think this is like, you know, Liz and I are contracting to do something and we're going to write up a uh, contract fresh. This is their contract that they use. This is like their... I know. I'm going to I'm going to disagree heavily because I, I do this on a regular basis with large large firms and I don't think they'll have an issue as long as you put that wording in. I, I'm just concerned that if we don't do that and we get a lawsuit, we're precluding ourselves from you know that defense. And it's in two of them, but not in all five. Again, it's it's a common thing I run into, and that's an easy way that both sides usually say fine because if it's not un allowed under mass law, they're not going to sue us and we're protecting ourselves. But that would be my opinion. So you'd make a motion to approve the contract based on the addition? Yeah, if you want a motion, I'll make a motion. We approve the contract with the changes of putting to the extent allowed by mass law in front of the three indemnification clauses that don't currently have it. I'll second that. So my question is, what happens if they say they're not going to add that wording? What does that do to the project? Charlie? Could we add that wording to the overall cover letter? We could do that. Instead of going into the flat, the, the complete document that they yeah. use for all there. Yeah. Add yeah. it into the cover letter instead. Yeah. As long as we include the cover letter into the T's and C's. Yes. Yes, sure. That sounds expeditious. Yeah. So then you would need to rescind your motion and start again. No, uh, I think. My motion is being accomplished by what Charlie said by doing it by a cover letter, that's all. But you, your motion stated to change it in the contract itself. So you would need to change what your motion was because you're going to add it to the... Uh, change the three indemnity clauses by adding that. And you can add it by addendum or you can add it by right in the body of it. So I, okay. I think it's fine either way. Okay. Question? Charlie? Are we talking from East Hampton all the way to the Westfield line? Uh, Not quite. Or a little bit smaller. Uh, T&B has already been out to the old WR Grace site in East Hampton, and as you know, that includes a few feet before you get to Coleman Road. They won't bother since that's already right, developed. Right. So Coleman Road, down to pretty much valley. It doesn't include everything right to the Westfield line because the railroad doesn't intend to sell the last few hundred yards or some number to that effect. On the theory, we're told, that they'd still like to be able to park the odd railroad car up and down the line there. If it supports their operations, whatever. Has anybody told them that there's no rails on Route Road? <laughs> I just drove over that way yesterday myself. The rails look like they're in horrid shape. I'd be surprised if you could run they rolling stuff. Just on the road. Well, I did notice that at Brickyard, I think it is. But it's Root Road in Westfield. Uh, Root Road, Root Road. Yeah. It's, it's okay, a mess well, over there. That's fine. I was just, you know. I suppose they're within their rights to lay fresh rail in there if they want. Man, I was just curious how far you were going with it. But uh, they established the, the limit to which they were going to sell a long time ago. It actually flipped and flopped a little bit, but ultimately settled down to something that's about Valley Road. 
So we have a motion and a second to sign the tie and bond contract contingent on the changes being made to the cover letter. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 But do you need a motion also to sign the actual letter? Yes, we need two motions. I think that was the motion. If that's the motion. The I have, sign that would change it. The second letter. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, it should be also noted that if we ever have to go into phase two, our interaction with PVPC, phase two being much more expensive sampling and so on, intense sampling, uh, I, I got a letter from PVPC that they would cover those costs uh, bec due to, I think, uh, based on a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency. And the second letter that we're going to be dealing with this evening is associated with this engineering assessment. Now, this is more expensive. It could be $10,000. And the route we're going is, again, working with PVPC. I'm just repeating myself here, but uh, they will hand a going after the request for performance, and they will also help us define the content because our knowledge as committees uh, and commissions uh, is somewhat limited. At what should we be looking for? And they have some experience there. And they're going to do that work. But another advantage working with them, they will base the cost on a grant known as District Local Technical Assistant. So basically, the RFP, Request for Performance, will be carried out by, by PVPC based on a state grant. So that's the second letter. I hope you, do we have a copy of it? We have the one letter there, and I thought it was for that purpose, but perhaps we don't. Liz can tell you what the letter says, and this, you can tell us which one it is. This letter says, Dear Mr. Brennan, the town of Southampton is in the process. That's the one. That's okay, the that's one. why I was wondering. I had two. Yeah, questions. that's so the one. Just to clarify, Charlie, you're saying we need to add a letter to the other the tie-in bond piece. That's correct. Okay. The environmental. We need to ask them to put in this, uh, the request that we have in that motion. So is there a motion from the board to sign the engineering assessment letter? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second. Is there other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Cool. I just got to say, I've heard renewed interest in people talking about this around town now, which is great to hear. Yeah. So yeah. thanks for all your help. Is this where you want me to sign before I sign it? I don't want to mess it up. Just this one. Tomorrow night for the negotiating committee? Are you on that? Okay. April okay. So if I come through another time, I can. So is that a sub thanks. subset of thanks, the Charlie. Greenway Thank committee? Thanks, Charlie. Versus the University of Greenway and Concom. Okay, thanks. So we have the bill warrants and the payroll warrants. Who has those? Right and has anyone had a chance to look at them? The two of us have. You have a chance? I also have no, I didn't. I didn't get a chance. So then we have minutes to approve. I have some questions on oh. the uh, bill warrants. You have questions on the bill warrants. All right, so let's. Individual ones? This is school mm -hmm. one. Okay, so we uh, not the school. I think Those are payroll warrants. Is that what you're talking about, Charlie? The ones that you looked at down there? Yeah. Okay. So we'll let Jackie look at them. While people are looking over the warrants, I'll go over the next meetings. On May 12th, um, we have a special executive session meeting. What time does that start? The board hasn't decided yet, but we also have a few very quick matters. If I could easily sneak them in right before that, um, it would probably keep the 19th meeting, if at all needed, to be very short. Does anybody have any objections to meeting at 6 o'clock on the 12th? Uh, I do. Or, okay, so 6.30 would no, be... No, I'm not, I'll be out of state. You're not going to be here on the 12th. So is that going to... That was a rescheduled executive session meeting we were going into the other day, and everyone agreed that the 12th was a good day. Yeah, I'm out of state now for several days. What do you mean by everybody? Everybody who was on the board at that time had agreed to that date. So, so I guess, con I mean, 
I feel like it's important that the entire board is present, but I also feel like it's important that we not push this off. Can we do it like Wednesday or Thursday? One of the individuals who needs to be present has already switched shifts in order to be present. So it's up to the board how they wish to proceed. I mean, as long as enough notice is given and to do any executive session, we try to shoot for at least the required of 48, but we try to give a week when possible. Jackie and Charlie, can you be there that day? Yes. I plan to be. So why don't we meet at 6 o'clock? We'll make sure that Shannon knows, and we need to, I, th I, I think it's important that we move forward with it. So 6 o'clock, and you can put the executive session right after that. After that, we have a, the annual town meeting at 7 o'clock at the Norris School. Um, do you want us there earlier? Again, it's going to be up to the board as far as whether they want to do a special meeting or a regular meeting that evening briefly to sign warrants and do regular housekeeping issues because otherwise we don't have the next meeting till the 1st of June. I would say that we should plan to be at Norris School at 6 o'clock as a board. Does that give us the 26th off? As long as the board doesn't decide to pursue anything else in between, yes. Okay, board don't decide to pursue anything in between. What, what day are we talking there? Uh, the 26th, we have nothing right now, so. A public safety. Um, I will say that the Memorial Day Parade is on May 25th, and last year I marched in it with just odds, which was excellent, but it so would be lovely to have any past or present or future Board of Selectmen members that would like to march with us because it was a very nice um, parade. So if you're in town, you need to meet at the Norris School at 8.30 and you can be right in the front and wear comfortable shoes. Dr. McDougall and Mr. Cauley and anyone else who was on the board in the past, we would love to have you. Um, the next regu regular meeting after that is June 2nd. Correct. Is that regular at 6.30 so far? It's whatever time the board wishes. 6.30 is a great time unless something comes up that we need. Uh, extra time we can change that we can go backwards now would someone like to read the warrants oh Charlie has questions go ahead you, Charlie. you have questions on all of them or a particular one I have questions on the ones pertaining to the boards the Board of Health the Water Department and the assessor's office mm -hmm. they all have only one signature from a board member to authorize payment is this customary from this board you mean or from that board? from, from yeah. that board it's usually isn't it the chair of the board I believe it's customary um, it's something that's always come through here it's up to the Board of Selectmen if it's something they wish I mean for instance if I was to if I was submitting my payroll sheet and need to be signed most likely the board wouldn't sign it because it comes before you anyway before you do the payroll piece but if this board feels that they wish for more than one person the problem runs into some of these boards don't meet regularly and it might, we don't want to hold up the payroll process, but it's however the board wishes to proceed. I ask the question because each one of these boards is independent. And because they're independent, they take their own actions. I'm not looking to hold back anybody's payroll. I'm trying to, as the, as the green member of the Board of Selectmen, understand what has been your past practice and making sure that we're all on the same page with this. Past practice has been one signature, but that does not mean that it's not something that we can't um, revisit and ask to change. I just wonder if something that you will run into is because they act independent, they will say that they don't have to follow what the Board of Selectmen says. So it could be a, a conversation. Then they're implying that the one authorization of a member is the action of the Board. I would think that they want something on record saying that that person has the ability to sign for the board. Maybe we can ask for that. Right. I have no problem signing this tonight, but I asked the question because mm -hmm. of the fact that they are boards. Right. Noted. Do you, do you want to ask the boards for where their designation comes from, or their approval comes from, and get something back in writing from them? I don't think that's a bad idea just to have on record to show I think yep. we need something on record that shows that one person's authorized to yep. sign the warrant yep. right I agree okay so can we send a letter out ask thank you and it may be something we want to incorporate in the selections policy absolutely 
So given those notes, is there a motion to sign and can someone read them? Uh, do you have other questions, Charlie? No. Okay. Guess we'll, guess we'll start with this one. This is uh, payroll warrant PD 15-43 for $38,170.92. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 If you say I make a motion to, then I only have to ask for a second. Okay. Uh, payroll warrant, uh, make a motion. We accept warrant PD 15-43A for $140,044.20. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Payroll warrant, uh, make a motion. We accept warrant PD 15 hyphen 45 for $39,345.92. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, stays with us. Uh, payroll warrant, I make a motion. We accept warrant P 15 hyphen 45 for $230,941.30. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now, do we have to make a motion for the school district voucher? No, they're just for you to look at. Okay. So that's Aye. all the warrants. Are set here. Have minutes from April 28th, regular meeting and an executive session meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Mm -hmm. I would accept a motion to approve the minutes from regular and executive session on April 28th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I abstain. At this point, we're going to move into executive session. We will not be coming back into open session. We'll move into executive session under Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21, Number 2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel. Uh, for number three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares. Under number three, the same thing two times, and also to approve minutes from meetings previously held in executive session. By roll call vote. Sears aye. Moulton aye. Martin aye. Charlie aye. Thank you very much for your time. I wonder, can you estimate your executive time? Ah. Uh...